Thank you for coming to this session on high quality high school options. Uh, I understand that we're in a uh, citywide, uh, city famous jazz club. <coughs> I was told this is one of the top two jazz clubs in the city apparently. I'm afraid we don't have that kind of entertainment this afternoon. And unfortunately, I don't think they're bringing in drinks. So we're just going to have to actually work here this afternoon. Um, but it will be a very entertaining and great panel anyway. So thank you, thank you so much for coming. My name is Betsy Brand. I'm the Executive Director of the American Youth Policy Forum. We're in Washington, D.C. Um, and for those of you who don't know AYPF, we provide information to policymakers at the national and the state level on strategies and policies and programs that help young people, per, uh, particularly disadvantaged young people, be successful in college and careers and citizenship. And we identify a lot of research-based and innovative programs around the country and share that information with policymakers. I've worked with a number of you in the audience over the years on many of these issues, and I know that a lot of you are experts and have innovative programs of your own right. So I hope that as we go through the uh, session this afternoon, you'll have a chance to share some of your expertise and ideas with us as well. So let me tell you a little bit about the structure of the panel um, and then introduce the session. Um, we will try to keep this interactive and give you a chance to engage. So we're going to start off with each present, uh, presenter making comments of about seven minutes, although we're giving our local host, Tom um, Michael Fitzpatrick, a buy on that. He's got a, a, a silent video show that he will show when he's making his comments. Um, but when we're finished with the opening comments, I'll engage with them in some moderated questions that we hope will bring out some of the themes of the conference. Uh, and then we'll have time for Q&A at the end. Um, so let me just start off by saying um, this is a little bit like deja vu conversation for me. And let's see, probably some others in the audience who've been talking about improving pathways for young people over many years. But I feel like we have actually made a lot of progress over the intervening years and that we do know a whole lot more about what works to help young people be successful. And you're going to hear about it from some of the folks on the panel today. Um, they're going to discuss the principles and the practices that make their programs successful in helping young people and how we can get some of these principles and practices expanded to other communities and to other schools. And we're going to examine some of the relationships that they've created with employers, which I think is a really critical aspect of the success. Um, but the reason we are talking about these, uh, this issue is that we don't have enough high schools. You've heard plenty of statistics earlier, so I'm not going to cite any of those. Um, but we know that enough children aren't completing high school prepared for post-secondary education and careers. And the achievement gaps are glaring and huge, and uh, we, we certainly can't let those continue. Um, we could continue to diagnose a lot of the reasons why high schools are failing many of our young people and why 30% of our young people have left high schools um, in total. But we really don't want to focus on the diagnosis problem right now. We've, we've, we've kind of worked that one to death, let's say. Um, so we really do want to talk about the innovative programs and some of the interesting models that have been put in place over the last, in some cases, uh, decades. Uh, with some of the speakers up here. Uh, and you're going to hear about four different approaches to creating multiple pathways to college and career. So let me introduce the presenters in the order that they're going to speak, and then they will come up to the podium one by one, and then we'll engage in Q&A. So our first presenter is Dick Hinckley. Uh, he is president and CEO of CORD, the Center for Occupational Research and Development in Waco, Texas, and I am a proud board member of the organization and have been for many, many, many years. Um, CORD creates educational tools and innovative uh, programs to empower faculty and prepare students for greater success in careers in higher education. Since 1970, Dick has worked in the education field as a teacher, principal, school superintendent, college dean, consultant, and company president. Um, many of you may know him from his work at Moraine Valley Community College in Illinois, where he was dean of workforce development and community service, and was instrumental in the development of one of their programs that became their tech prep consortia. Um, and tech prep is a, is a creature of CORD, which has now become uh, 
really the career pathways effort that they have, um, that they're supporting across the country. Um, our second presenter is Gary Hochlander, known to many of you as an expert in career and tech ed, but also much more than that. He is now president of Connect Ed, the California Center for College and Career. Um, he's widely known for his expertise in CTE and many other aspects of elementary, secondary, and post-secondary education. And he's consulted extensively for the U.S. Department of Education, state departments of education, local school districts, and a variety of other organizations. In 2006, with the support from the James Irvine Foundation, Gary established Connect Ed, which is dedicated to advancing practice policy and research designed to help prepare young people for college and career. And Connect Ed's primary mission is supporting the development of the Linked Learning Pathways to College and Career Success Initiative, which you'll hear more about. And they've been implementing systems of linked learning in nine, nine large school districts in the state of California, and just recently expanded to Detroit, I believe. Our third presenter is, uh, you heard from him very briefly, introducing the governor, Tom Friedman, who is the superintendent of the Francis Tuttle Tech Center in Oklahoma City. And I remember visiting the Francis Tuttle Center, I won't tell you how many years ago, but a really long time ago, uh, when I was at the Department of Education. And it really blew my mind. And I think one of the most impressive things was the care and um, and dedication that they put into the building so that that was a center of excellence that as soon as students walked into the doors, they felt like they were valued and special and doing something that was really critically important to the economy. And I think that is a message that we don't send enough to our young people. Um, Francis Tuttle is a premier provider of career and technology education with an enrollment of nearly 28,000 students. With its three campuses, the school district provides a wide array of programs and services that include traditional career tech majors, college prep career academies, customized industry training and instruction, um, and they also serve adjudicated youth. Tom has a long career in the CTE field, and under his leadership, Francis Tuttle remains one of the premier CTE institutions in the United States. And go visit if you have never had a chance to do that. Um, our final presenter is a, is a local guy, so thank you for hosting us in this area. Michael Fitzpatrick is superintendent and director of the Blackstone Valley Vocational Regional School District in Upton, Mass. Uh, in 2011, Michael was selected as the Massachusetts Superintendent of the Year, and he's a nationally recognized expert in career and tech ed whose contributions to education and school improvement have led to numerous accolades. Under his leadership, Valley Tech was one of six school systems nationwide to receive the 2004 National School of Change Award for significant and meaningful change. And he's been featured in various media for his, as being a new face of career in tech ed. So with that, I would like to ask Dick to the podium. Thank Betsy. Uh, in trying to pick who was going to go first, Betsy said, would the oldest white guy on the panel please stand up? So, so that was about That's it. all of us. <laughs> so that was about it, huh, Betsy? Uh, again, it's a little, uh, also a little humbling to, to stand here knowing that there are people out in this audience that could do a better job than, than I could. Uh, Bill Daggett and certainly Gene Bottoms and others in the room uh, with, with what they do for high schools and for education, uh, they, they should be doing this. But in any case, I'm with CORD. Uh, I'm not gonna talk about CORD other than to say uh, we have been around for 30 years. Uh, we're heavily invested in STEM education. Certainly at both the secondary and post-secondary levels, we're international. Uh, teaching materials, teacher professional development to go with it, contextual teaching and learning, math and science, we're, we're all over that map. But we exist in the, in the city of Waco in Texas, and we are a business. Although we're in the business of education, we're a business in our community. And as a business, we feel we have a corporate social responsibility as any business in a community. We've helped start the P20 Council uh, a couple years ago and uh, in a, in a multi-county area in Texas. We started the Greater Waco Community Education Alliance 
with the mayor, uh, then mayor in town, which is now in, going into its sixth year, uh, has a board that includes the president of Baylor University and the, the presidents of the local community and technical colleges and business leaders. Uh, the former ambassador to Sweden is on it, uh, to Bill Clinton. And so it's a, it's a big concern. It's a corporate social responsibility. Well, many years ago, CORD helped um, the Waco Independent School District start what's called the A.J. Moore Academy. Now, Bill's organization, the International Center for Leadership, and the, the National Academy Foundation has, has designated A.J. Moore as a model. Right, Bill? One of the models. And that's what I'm going to talk about is, is A.J. Moore Academy. And uh, it, uh, again, it started in 1996. It has 700 students. Now, just last year, I mean, it's been on its own campus. Just last year, A.J. Moore, in a budget cutback, it was determined they would incorporate or move their campus to University High School and it's with its 1,800 students. And as we go through this and talk about that, we all had a lot of fear about what was going to happen. But as a model, it's, it's happening just the opposite the way we thought. But the entire University High will now be going into an academy model in the next year. Uh, again, 700 students at uh, A.J. Moore right now, school within a school. Uh, they are 34% African American, 50% Hispanic, 16% white. The academy, uh, of the academy population, 22% are disabled. 84% are economically disadvantaged. And Waco's poverty rate's 27%. So that's the milieu that we're talking about as we look at the A.J. Moore Academy. They have several academies, which I will mention pretty soon. But first, I'll say the academy graduation rate is 98%. The attendance rate's 95%. 90% of the students indicate that they are going to go to post-secondary institutions. Many of them graduate with multiple dual credit hours. And the class of 2009 received $1.8 million in scholarships to go to uh, post-secondary. Bill, you probably have other statistics on the top of your head about A.J. Moore. Very active business advisory committee of 60 members. They meet monthly. They have subcommittees on recruitment, student life, industry education, curriculum, internships, mentoring, public relations, and fundraising scholarships. The Academy, uh, and you can go to CORD's website and download this document for free, Thriving in Challenging Times. We put out this a few years ago with the uh, Institute for a Competitive Workforce of the Chamber of Commerce, and it uh, has 17 examples of Career Pathways programs teeing off of the business involvement, the heavy business involvement in these 17 models. A.J. Moore Academy's Finance Academy is listed in here as one of the models. We also talk about career pathways in general. Pathways to Prosperity is, is given a page in the document. But you can download Thriving in Challenging Times uh, free on our website. Or if you want a hard copy, just let me know. The Finance Academy, as an example, has business partners all the way through the community. Educators Credit Union, Brasses Higher Education Authority, Insurers of Texas, uh, Extra Co Bank, Chase Bank. How am I doing on time? Am I okay? One minute. All right. Two minutes. The finance students, by the way, offer after school income tax services. They prepare over 6,000 returns a year. Over $8 million in refunds are attributed to them. And the IRS has designated them as one of the top 10 volunteer income tax certification sites in Texas. They have other programs uh, in their ac academy model, in, in automotive, in transportation. But as they uh, go out to the whole of University High, they're looking at all 16 career clusters to develop um, academy models at University High. So while we were concerned that, that the A.J. Moore Academy would die when it went into this high school in a 
in a consolidation of buildings, it in fact is taking over. And so as a model, it's quickly proved itself to a new principle that uh, it was worth it. Uh, the current academies are, as I said, information science. I mentioned business, finance, hospitality, tourism, law, criminal justice, health science, automotive. They are totally integrated. The academic and the, the CT classes are integrated. Contextual teaching and learning models are used. Real world, world experiences, problem-based learning is used. And faculties in it are also adjunct teachers at both McLennan Community College and Texas State Technical College. So as a model, we feel uh, in Waco, it's an excellent one. It has the, the reputation and the distinction and the honors of being designated a model. So thank you. Good afternoon. Um, like Dick, uh, I would be uh, remiss if I didn't acknowledge that a lot of what I'm going to share with you this afternoon, I have learned from so many different people in this room, um, including my colleagues on, on the panel. I, for the past now, I guess seven years, have had the honor of leading, with the support of the James Irvine Foundation in California, uh, the California Linked Learning District Initiative. Um, in linked learning, we like to celebrate student work. And so at the end of each year now, we bring all of our uh, districts together, and we have a Northern California exhibition and a Southern California exhibition. And we bring students and their teachers and parents and employers together uh, to look at student work, to share student work. Last year, I was at the uh, exhibition in Long Beach, and there were four students from the digital media pathway, link learning pathway at Hollywood High School. They had their project there. They were there with their teachers. They had had to, to produce a two-minute trailer uh, that they could use to pitch a longer documentary to studio executives in Hollywood. And these four students had decided to do a trailer on the history of discrimination in the Los Angeles Unified School District. Uh, in their English class, they had written the script. Uh, in their social studies class, they had done history on how discrimination had evolved in Los Angeles and uh, how it had been addressed. And of course, in their videography class, uh, they learned how to produce a video, and they learned about sound, and they learned about design, and their final product was this two-minute trailer, which they got to pitch to the vice president of MTV. And I said to these kids, four kids, I said, wow, you got, you got to pitch this to the vice president of MTV. What was the most important thing that he had to tell you? And they looked at me, and they didn't miss a beat, and they said, spelling matters. <laughs> <laughs> and their teachers laughed, and they said, you know, we've been telling them that forever. But until they heard it from the vice president of MTV, they didn't really believe us. And that, that's what linked learning really is all about. Linked learning is an approach. There's no one right way to do this. Uh, there are career academies, theme-based high schools. In, what we, in California, we call California partnership academies. Um, and what we have been trying to do in California is to provide a, a framework, an umbrella, under which a variety of different approaches to really transforming high school. This is not a CTE initiative. CTE is a very important part. I'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, but this really is an initiative that is about creating a very different experience in high school for young people. A good approach, however, does have four important components. There is a college preparatory academic core the math, the science, the English, the social studies, even the foreign language, that students need to be eligible for admission to the University of California, to the California State University system, and even though it's not required to succeed in the California community college system, and indeed in the more advanced apprenticeship programs, particularly in the skilled trades. There is a technical core, a cluster or sequence of four or more technical courses that deliver industry and occupational knowledge and skill in the, in the industry that is the theme uh, of the pathway. 
And ideally, and this is easy to say, it's very hard to do, those academic courses are tightly integrated with the technical courses. So that in a pathway in architecture, construction, and engineering, a geometry class, for example, is teaching students about how the Pythagorean theorem, the three, four, five triangle, is used in the world of architecture and construction and engineering. In a calculus class, they're learning how calculus is used to design a seismically safe Bay Bridge. So it's not business as usual in the academic core. It's taking advantage of the pathway theme to really emphasize real world application and help students better know why do I need to do this? It's a fair question. It's rare that we give kids an honest answer. Thirdly, there is a uh, systematic approach to work-based learning. What I mean by work-based learning, I do not mean work experience. As valuable as I think that is, that's not what I mean. If I were to take you to the Health Careers Academy in Palmdale High School, on the morning I visited, in a group of 25 on a group internship, students are out with their classroom teacher at Kaiser Permanente learning how to do electrocardiograms. Not all of you in this room are old enough to have yet had an electrocardiogram, but if you had, you know how it goes. The kids are working on real patients. They're putting that gel on, they're attaching the leads, they're working with the physician's assistant to interpret those results. And that afternoon, they're back in their medical science class, and they're learning about the human cardiovascular system and the role that electricity plays in regulating the human heart and how heart disease interferes with that electrical system which of course is precisely what the electrocardiogram and that technology is designed to do. Now those of you who are teachers know that connection did not happen by accident. That teacher worked very, very carefully with that physician's assistant at Kaiser to structure that kind of closely linked work-based learning experience. And finally, there are student supports of which in my view the most important are supplemental instruction in reading, writing, and mathematics because as you all know, we have way too many kids coming into the ninth grade who are not sufficiently proficient in those subjects to succeed in the kind of challenging pathway that this program of study uh, represents. And again, that supplemental instruction is taught in context. It's not repeating the algebra that the kids really couldn't master uh, in eighth grade. We organize these pathways around the major industry sectors that are the basis of our career and technical education standards in California. Nothing magic about these or rigid about these. Uh, we have pathways in engineering or architecture, construction engineering. <coughs> but the, this, this framework and the CTE standards in California uh, provide a framework for really introducing uh, that applied content and industry focus uh, into uh, pathways. As I indicated, no one right way to do this. There are wrong ways to do it. Uh, but in California, linked learning is being delivered through a career academies, theme-based uh, theme, uh, theme small learning communities, themed small high schools, and individual models like high tech high, new tech, or big picture schools. Again, I think in closing, the most important message that I can leave with you are two things. One, as we think about this work, this cannot be just a CTE initiative. CTE has to be connected to the mainstream elementary, secondary, and post-secondary education that is really going to prepare all students for being ready for both college and career. Secondly, and maybe we'll have some more time to talk about in this in the, in the panel, in California, I think what distinguishes our work is we're taking a systemic approach. These pathways are not new. Um, you know, when I started this work some 30 years ago, the first thing I did was go to Aviation High School, Murray Bertram School of Commerce. These, these have been around for years, but they exist in spite of the system rather than because of it. And in California, we're working with school districts, we're working with communities to build the infrastructure and the supports that can sustain and expand and improve this work over time. So if you want to learn more, go visit our website. Um, it's just connectedcalifornia.org, uh, and I look forward to uh, being able to interact with you a little bit more. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it's a, an honor to be here with this panel and talk to you a little bit about Francis Tuttle. And I think what I'm going to do uh, first is uh, talk a little bit about the structure in Oklahoma, because it is a lot different, I think, than what you'll find in most states. And before we get started, uh, there should be a handout on your desk about Francis Tuttle. And I want to uh, 
something may appear somewhat inconsistent on, on my intro. Uh, uh, Betsy was saying we have 28,000 students. That includes our, our, our customized industry training, the work we do for business and industry, and also our night school enrollment, our evening programs, our avocational, uh, actually, and our, our, um, our online students. Actually, on the campus, we have 2,300 students, and that's what's reflected in your handout. So I just want to provide some clarity there. Um, a little bit about Oklahoma, it, well, I think that makes us unique, and I think is part of the reason we have an infrastructure that we're extremely proud of, is the fact that we have three uh, separate legs of, of education. We have, of course, the higher regents for, for higher education, you know, the colleges and universities. They have their own separate board and a chancellor that goes directly to the legislature and, and lobbies for money and legislation and things of that nature. And then, of course, we have the State Department of Education, our own state superintendent of public instruction, same type of relationship with the legislature, same type of a of a local government, I mean, of statewide governance structure. But in Oklahoma, what makes us unique, we have a separate state board of career and technical education. Those board members are appointed by the governor, and uh, we have a state director of career tech, and that individual is, uh, um, has uh, no relations, I mean, uh, his has a direct relationship with the legislature. He lobbies the legislature, talks to the legislature, and, and uh, we have our own separate funding uh, from the state that we receive. So we have sep three legal, um, three equal and separate entities of education in Oklahoma. So that's one thing that, that I think uh, uh, separates us. Also, at, like at Francis Tuttle, um, we are actually a consolidated district by vote of the people. We're a separate public school district. We have our own uh, taxing authority. We uh, can tax up to 15 mills on the local Valorum tax base. We have our own uh, uh, bonding capacity. We have our own locally elected board of education, five member board structured very similarly to a public school, only that we consolidate uh, a number of school districts. At Francis Total, for instance, we have six separate school districts that we encompass their territory, and then we impose a relatively small ad valorem tax levy on that on that elevated uh, that, that uh, level of, of uh, funding base, and it gives us the uh, the funds that we need to be able to operate career tech education. Basically, we have kind of a tagline. We like to say that we're local people paying local taxes to support local training programs for local jobs for local people again. And uh, we're funded with 80% local dollars. So when the state comes in one of those lows, right now things are going good in Oklahoma because of all the oil and gas activity and, and the new technologies that are going on there. But there will be a time when the state will have to issue a 5, 10, 20% cutback in state funds. It's a pretty good hiccup to us, but it doesn't really, uh, it's only uh, about 15% of our budget. Uh, we get about 5% federal funds, but the 80% local funds, I think, is what keeps us going. And um, it's something that, uh, that uh, um, we feel like is extremely important to us. We also, um, um, you know, un unlike maybe like a technical high school, I know like in many states, we don't have football teams, bands, gymnasiums to build, cheerleading squads. Every penny that we get from local tax dollars goes for one thing and one thing only, and that's uh, to support our mission. Our mission is to uh, um, prepare our students for success in the workplace. Um, our adult, our population, those 2,300 students that we have, it's about 50-50, post-secondary and high school students, high school juniors and seniors. And these are mixed programs, they're blended. We have a lot of folks ask, ask us about that, as to how that works, and, and I think I want to uh, talk a little bit about what I consider the adult advantage. First of all, it's an automatic demand on the quality of our program. Adults pay tuition, high school juniors and seniors, it's part of their free public education. So when adults in there, he's expecting some bang for his buck. You know, he doesn't have to be there. That's a school of choice for him. And uh, if the quality's not there, we notice our adult enrollment goes down. Why is it going down? Because those adults aren't having any value added as far as they're concerned. And so um, uh, that's important to us. Matter of fact, uh, they also help us uh, in uh, making sure, you know, the, uh, the horse play and monkey business that goes on sometimes at juniors and seniors is held to minimum. Uh, I was in a classroom the other day, and the instructor was telling me that uh, he could have kissed his adult student, and this kid about, probably I say kid about, you know, all of us are gray hair, like anybody 25 years old as a kid, but he was an adult. And he said that uh, there was some horseplay going on back of the auto mechanics program. He snapped his fingers at him. He said, you guys, listen up. I'm paying for this. I want to hear what this man has to say. And it was like having, you know, a teacher aide in the program already. And so the, our, our students actually like that. So from that standpoint, uh, they also serve as role models. So. Uh, we feel like it, it has far more advantages than it does any disadvantages that may appear. And most of our adults are in that probably 20 to 35 year old range. Uh, we have a few maybe that are older than that. Uh, we're not a high school, but we provide programs that are sending high schools uh, except for high school credit. We're not a technical college, but we provide training that 
our uh, uh, two technical colleges, our two community colleges, rather, in the Oklahoma City area except for college credit. So we're really kind of a hybrid uh, situation. Um, so let's focus on the high school mission a little bit. Our students, uh, because um, uh, we're, we're focused primarily on career tech, uh, we have our students for three-hour blocks. And uh, say if they're enrolled in a, in a CAD program or they're enrolled in cosmetology or maybe cybersecurity, they'll take that program for three hours, five days a week, but then the complement of that day, the other three hours, they'll go to their sending high school, and that's where they receive their electives and their, and their academics. They'll get math, history, science, uh, art, uh, speech, anything, you know, vocal music, band. That happens at the sending school, so we don't have to be, be involved with that, so we can focus on one thing and one thing only. We don't offer any high school credit, but that uh, what is, what is a neat deal for us. I keep hitting this, do I have to keep doing things over there? Okay, it's not. Okay, I won't hit it anymore. That's what I'll do. <laughs> at, at any rate, uh, uh, like right across the road from us is Putnam City North High School. And uh, Putnam City North doesn't offer um, a CAD program, but uh, if they have a student that enrolls at Francis Tuttle, uh, the transcript will be uh, that you can receive at Putnam City North High School will have CAD on it. And somebody may look at that transcript and say, I didn't know Putnam City North High School offered CAD. And they say, well, it doesn't. Just, you know, they'll be offered at our, at our lab, which happens to be Francis Tuttle across the street. So we think that gives us a, a, a good relationship from the standpoint of a of uh, establishing a partnership with the school that increases their, if we have 36 programs, they have 36 programs. Uh, we provide all the transportation to the send, from the sending school to Francis Tuttle. We, they meet at their sending high school and then, uh, and then they come to our school. That provides a lot of logistic problems, but it's something that we can work out. Okay, two minutes. A um, uh, little bit of, uh, about our diversity. We um, have 92% um, of one high school has free and reduced lunch, and the other high school has only 8%. So you can see there's a, there's a large diversity in, in, in the populations that we serve. Um, we're funded well. That's one thing that, uh, you know, I think, uh, and how many times have you heard anybody in public education say we're well funded? Well, we are. And uh, that was the dream of, of uh, Dr. Francis Toto. He used to be a state director in Oklahoma. When he, before that, he was a comprehensive school superintendent. And uh, one of the things that he, he, he figured out early was, you know, career tech is expensive education. And most high schools can't afford to provide it. But if you consolidate the district, put a relatively small millage on that, on that in increased wealth, you can have the kind of uh, 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 resources that you need to be able to do that. And um, uh, moving right along to some other things uh, that I think make us a little bit unique. Uh, uh, just recently, um, we've aligned all of our instruction to the International Center for Leadership and Education. You heard Bill Daggett's uh, 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 talk about uh, the integration of academics and the career tech using the rigor and relevance uh, framework. We are, we're converting all of our curriculum to align to that, and we feel like the results have just been tremendous from the standpoint of establishing uh, credibility to, um, to, to what we're doing in the academic arena. We have also are using Project Lead the Way for two career-focused academies, and the thing that that has done is uh, with the Project Lead the Way curriculum, and actually it's a college prep, which if you had told me when I was getting into this business that we'd be college prep someday, I'd say that's not my Voltec that I knew. But that has opened up doors to a market that we didn't even know existed out there. Moms and dads that wouldn't give us the time of the day all of a sudden now are telling their students, and you know what, they're enrolling in other career tech programs that are non-academy based. So there's a lot of spinoff value to that. You know, little Johnny took the uh, Bioscience and Medicine Academy, and maybe he's in his second year of, of med school, and he's got the youngest in the family who's not, you know, doesn't want to do that, but maybe he wants to be a welder. All of a sudden, we have credibility with that, those folks. So that's probably one of the biggest things that we've had from the standpoint of, uh, of uh, the way that, w that we do things. And all of our curriculum is uh, competency-based, or progress-based, and we feel like that uh, gives us a, an inroad to big, he big, heavy emphasis on career student organizations. We feel like that's a way of, of, of creating light bulbs in students when they have a chance to compete in state and national events. Rather, you, um, uh, I'm here for questions and answers. I got a little bit more, but I maybe can do that on the Q and A. Thank, Thank you. You bet. Thanks, Paul. Well, it's not every day that a Fitzpatrick gets invited to speak uh, the day after St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> but you will note that uh, they waited as long as they could. I noticed Betsy referenced this room and its environment um, relative to the jazz. It reminded me more of the former Boston Garden with the obstruct obstructed view. 
<laughs> now also notice that everyone here has been provided with an opportunity. If your state were to host this conference next time, you too could secure an additional two minutes to speak. <laughs> <laughs> On behalf of my career tech colleagues from Massachusetts, uh, who I have the pleasure of working with every day, I welcome you to Massachusetts. We serve some 45,000 uh, high school students on a daily basis and connect with a number of other activities associated with post-secondary uh, and other programs. In the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, there are 351 cities and towns. There are 26 regional vocational technical schools. These are settings of cities and towns that have come together in a common interest of providing quality vocational technical education monitored closely by the state of Massachusetts. In addition, we have a number of urban vocational settings uh, we also have three county agricultural schools uh, and a number of consortium or collaborative environments. Now, one of the things I mentioned to my students uh, that I was making, or been asked to share some thoughts, and so they prepared uh, a little video, as, as Betsy mentioned, it's more like a Skyping style video to give you some insight, <coughs> because with the exception of a team from Oklahoma that will be visiting our school on Wednesday, uh, you won't get an opportunity to see it. Okay. Well, while no child left behind and the race to the top policymakers often struggle with where do they want education to go, career tech education has fostered an environment for teaching experimentation. At Blackstone Valley Tech, we teach students to be curious and to be nice to others. We encourage creativity in an age where schools have acquired a reputation for maintaining an outdated industrial agricultural approach for order, discipline, and early assembly line manufacturing. Rather than cultivate complacency, we aggressively seek industry's input, blended with new professional development, acquired staff skills in a constant search for the work skills which will be needed in the future. The Blackstone Valley Tech leadership team shapes an annual retreat and a blueprint which mission aligned measurable performance goals with regular input and review by our school board. The feedback pushes the system through the responsibilities throughout. In summary, the leadership team is often encouraged to get out of the way, but not so far as they are disconnected. Our curriculum is a launching pad for students to advance their general interest and their dreams. As we cultivate a new wave of people who design and make things, we constantly remain alert to opportunity. Our integrated academic and vocational technical instruction is intended to liberate the humanity and the potential of every child we serve. Our inherent social policy requires students to solve problems, take risk, adopt resilience, be inventive, and consider the unique rewards of entrepreneurship. One example, when personnel at the United States Army Natick Labs needed a chamber that would resist the heat, acid, and other uh, interferences that would sterilize their microscope and interfered with their experimentation. They drew upon the expertise and the observation of two of our co-op students, who in turn were awarded a U.S. patent for the new design and attachments that allowed this to go forward. We have an a number of initiatives under, in our district. Our students are totally ours. They come to us and they participate. They choose to either participate or, or be part of our system or one of the sending school systems. We have an extended school year. While it is common in Massachusetts to have a 180-day teaching year, we have a 193-day teaching year. We have a variety of summer activities, whether it be barbecues for the neighbors just to get along, assembly line of constant improvements in the reconfiguration of our structure, uh, the, uh, in our labs, oftentimes by our own students and staff working in a cost-effective manner. We regularly look at a business model of analyzing the time lost or, uh, in scheduling or in uh, changing classes uh, or in other, any other environment. Our students are re required to create electronic portfolios consistent with what the presentations at Caterpillar or Southwark Milton and uh, uh, the airline industries mentioned earlier today. We have a tendency to field test in one year an activity or an innovation, and then we'll make modifications and refinements the following year with the input of the staff who we value. We have an aggressive and elaborate nutritional analysis program. We also have depression screening. We want every student to feel not only safe, 
but that we monitor their welfare uh, and uh, helps us with their attendance, school pride, and all the Maslow considerations. I support the approach that we have encouraged at Blackstone Body Tech with two comments, both as recently as two weeks ago. Lee Kuan Ki, Asia's ranking philosophical king and the former Prime Minister of Singapore in the Wall Street Journal interview of two weeks ago, stated, America's creativity, its resilience, and innovative spirit will allow it to confront its core problems, overcome them, and regain its competitiveness. Americans believe they can make things happen, and they usually do. The 2013 a American Association of School Administrators National Conference of two weeks ago in Los Angeles, one of the keynote speakers was Yong Zhao, the president chair of the University of Oregon. He commented, the world needs creative and entrepreneurial talents who are globally competent to take advantage of the opportunities brought about by technology and globalization and tackle the tough challenges facing human beings. But our schools are being pushed to produce homogeneous, compliant, and employee-minded test takers as a result of the seductive power of the traditional education paradigm. I am pleased to see that the staff and students that I work with every day have responded to these challenges and are constantly looking throughout our country and elsewhere for models of replication, models of excellence that we will consider. The students that put this together give you a sense of their interaction on a couple of different matters. You will notice throughout the slides that you also notice that this, there's a picture of a, uh, a swimming area. That's where one of the students who did the video is a lifeguard during the summer. Uh, in any case, um, that what you see is a couple common themes here. Our students regularly prepare, organize, and design things for younger students. I haven't witnessed a greater motivation in my life. And so that we are interacting regularly with kindergarten through eighth grade students in a variety of Lego competitions, uh, nutritional programs, uh, watch your mouth, sense of dental uh, programs, and others. In addition, you will find regular integration by industry. We value the input of industry. We are very concerned that students come to us for a ninth grade education, but they don't graduate for four years. Many pursue further education, which means they don't enter the workforce for six years or eight years later. It is certainly an, a high demand to expect that we would continue to design things that are that far reaching and that far out. You'll see a variety of student work and some samples. I gave them a free reign on how they felt, as they say, kind of a Skyping type approach uh, to what happens on a day-by-day -day basis. We happen to be a 1,200 pupil operation, somewhat rural. Uh, at this point, I look as, I, I appear as the, the local rabbi, minister, or priest, because I'm out raising the money for that budget uh, for next year, but my colleagues are not alone uh, in that expectation of the superintendent. It's an interesting political challenge, but it's a fun thing to do for students. Uh, we're pleased to interact with um, high schools that work, the Skills USA competitions. Uh, we look for competitions regularly to enhance and create other opportunities to showcase our talent. No student has to come to our school. They come because they want to and choose to. Uh, the interest in coming is strong, uh, therefore the value of a seat is respected and appreciated. Discipline is not an issue because students are usually engaged uh, and uh, the public visitations uh, and other things are such that uh, there's a regular uh, observation by our public uh, that invests in our education. Um, the, uh, so it's a sample uh, of what we intended to share. I trust that it, it'll run out very shortly. Okay, so I'll stay within your timeline. That's okay. great. Okay, thank you. Thanks to all the panelists, and thank you, Michael, for bringing this slideshow. It's nice to see students in action and get a sense of what some of them are doing during the day. So um, I want to take a few minutes to uh, have some Q&A with the panel before we open it up to you all. Um, and you all described some um, programs that are similar in some respects and also different in other respects. But I'm wondering if we could begin to explore a couple of the uh, common elements or essential practices that you feel are really critical to success to these types of programs. So either from the perspective of your own program or just your, your kind of general knowledge about the field in terms of providing um, successful uh, integrated programs. What are some of the key elements or essential practices that need to be in place to have successful programs 
um, such as the ones that you've described and, and that we would like to see. And, and I'll open this up, and if you want to have a little dialogue um, among yourselves, that's fine. So anybody want to start? Dick, look, sure. looks like you're ready to start. Yeah, I think it all came, comes down to leadership. Um, certainly with A.J. Moore, De the first principal, Deborah Bishop, and now Angela Ryer. Uh, if you don't have a principal engaged or a leader in the school, it's not going to happen uh, or happen nearly as effectively. And certainly in the case of A.J. Moore, it was a very, very strong business and industry involvement. They have been with it all the way through. I mentioned uh, this last year they were integrated into the local high school, and as the school board was discussing the shortage of funding in Texas and what was going to happen to everybody's budget and why they needed to close some schools and why A.J. Moore Academy itself, the building itself, was on the block, the business community started uh, organizing behind A.J. Moore and its model very effectively. They met with school board members individually and collectively and they pressed the case. So the, the key elements, uh, I would say, in this case were leadership, uh, great leadership, and strong business and industry. Thank you. Anybody else on the panel? Yeah, I'll take a, a crack at that. I, I already detailed what we thought were the critical components of a pathway. Let me just quickly run down what we think some of the critical aspects are of a systemic approach, and, and it really builds, Dick, on some of what you said. So as I indicated, um, we really focus on two objectives. We're very uh, clear about the need to promote high quality pathways at the school site level, and we have very detailed pathway certification criteria that specify that. But I think most importantly, or equally important, we're very clear about the need to build uh, a community-wide or district-wide system of support for this work. And that means at least five things. One, at the highest levels of community and district leadership, there is real buy-in and commitment and championing for this work. And I think, you know, I've worked in this field for a long, long time, and I think in California, it's the first time that we've had a critical mass of superintendents and school board members and post-secondary chancellors who really champion this work. It's not just a, a school site. So leadership critical at the district level. Um, part of that sort of systemic building is at the district level building a system of internal coaching for principals and pathway leads. You cannot do this work if you do not have a principal who understands what it takes to support this in the school. A principal who understands the importance of the master schedule in how you organize an effective program of study. A principal who understands the importance of common planning time for teachers to build the kind of integrated curriculum, integrated projects that you saw represented in the slideshow. Um, and on and on and on. Thirdly, there has to be a work-based learning system and staff in place to support uh, opportunities for all young people to interact with working adults to produce real value. Again, it's not about work experience. Uh, it's about really building an effective system of work-based learning, and that's a district, if not a regional, uh, systemic approach. And finally, there's got to be a data system in place with a clear set of metrics that is tracking progress on a range of indicators of students' uh, preparation for both college uh, and career. That's my list. <laughs> Yeah, I'll just uh, piggyback a little bit uh, on what was said. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, I, Michael said it uh, as well as anybody. Well, you know, we're schools of choice, and I guess the uh, um, thing that keeps me up at nights is uh, thinking I'm going to go to Francis Tuttle and, and that, that Taj Mahal. I'm glad he said that in front of my governor. But uh, <laughs> at any rate, and, and see empty parking lots. And, you know, that could happen the minute we stop adding value. And I think the way that you do that, you have to have an engaged faculty that, that has a passion for students. We have two uh, rounds of interviews, and it kind of goes back to the Jim Collins uh, deal on good to great, you know, it's, uh, get the right people on the bus, and, and, if you, and it's a lot easier to make decisions, you know, with, uh, with personnel if you make sure you hire the right folks up front. 
Uh, we had a first round of interviews for, and just to make sure that we have the technical skills by our, by our teaching faculty and staff. And then the second round is to make sure we have a culture fit. Culture is something we spend a lot of time with at Francis Tuttle, and, and our culture is customer service. We kind of, you know, if you're not, uh, the most important people we have in our school are the teachers. We have a lot of support folks, including the superintendent, all the way through the organization, but, but we have kind of a tagline there that if you're not teaching a student, help someone who is. And, uh, and so there's, there's this, this thing that focuses on passion that uh, we really work on uh, uh, a lot with our, with our faculty and staff because they've got those students three hours a day. And they can make or break, break you when they, when they have those in there because students know whether or not uh, that teacher has a passion for what they do and who they are. Uh, the, the curriculum is, is so important. Uh, the one thing I think that bores students more than anything is everybody has to go through a lockstep method and go at the same pace and, and do this. And some are held back, some are moving too fast. And, and if somebody feels like they're going in their own pace and they can finish a program, uh, uh, you know, a, a four-letter word, I think, in most career tech programs is, is seat time. And, uh, and that keeps things uh, uh, ex excited. Um, I mentioned it always helps to have uh, you know, adequate funding and, and to be able to kind of put it in the curriculum that you need. Advisory committees, engaged advisory committees. I know that's something that's not new to career tech, but I think engaged advisory committees are so important to make sure that that, that curriculum is relevant and that it's related to what they're going to see when they get out in the workforce at some point. Betsy, given the comments that have been made, I just offer a, a couple others, but I certainly agree with those. Uh, uh, project planning, of course, is a, is a key factor. The relevance, which has been mentioned. The administrative coordination to show support for, uh, uh, for the teachers and others who would take risk to do things over and above the traditional learning. Uh, oftentimes, you need to fight for the finances or the additional resources necessary uh, to make something possible and provide free and reduced lunch youngsters with the options that, uh, so there's not an obstacle to participation. Uh, I think student interaction and involvement in the planning and feedback uh, can be a great learning experience and also helpful to refine uh, the experience. The advanced preparation to maximize the, the total activity. Um, I, I can think of a field trip on a, on a canal that was utilized and the students were given, uh, I was delighted to be invited to go and, and I did that, but they had 30 questions they had to answer. And so they were looking at the speed and some of the development along the canal as far as mills that now are uh, uh, helping elderly citizens and things. But they had targeted questions and targeted learning. Uh, so it was cap, cap maximizing the experience. Uh, and the small things, the thank yous that were sent to park rangers that need to be sent to others. And there's great public relations value on these things in the sense of the added uh, opportunities available at your school, return on investment for the taxpayers, uh, and the sense of pride in, in the attitudinal climate. Mm -hmm. All great suggestions. So um, if we could all just get all of those elements and put them in a building all together, that would be great. Um, that's a lot harder than that. And I'm thinking, um, one of the challenges, and some of you will be able to answer this a little bit better than others given your positions, but um, one of the challenges that we have in the United States is that um, of, over, of the over 13,000 school districts that we have in the United States, close to 8,000 are classified as rural, in either rural fringe, rural distant, rural distant or rural remote, and many of you, given the uh, states you come from are familiar. And about one third of American students are in school districts like that. And oftentimes, there are a lot fewer resources uh, in those school districts. Given that we're talking about all kids everywhere across the United States, and we have you know one third of our students in school districts like this that really don't get as much attention oftentimes as, uh, as they should, do you have thoughts on how to help take these ideas and elements and principles and and uh, get them into some of those communities that might not have the same number of resources as it sounds you've been able to muster. And anybody feel free, I know Oklahoma, you might have some thoughts on that given your Yeah, um, and that's, that's a, you know, Oklahoma is rural. I mean, we, outside of Tulsa and Oklahoma City, you're talking rural Oklahoma. And, and you heard uh, Bill Simons talk uh, about this, the, the young lady from a, a high school that has like 15 or graduating class to wind up getting a full ride to MIT. No way that could have happened in Crescent, Oklahoma, had not she been part of a consolidated school district. So I guess what I'm saying is, you know, consolidate school districts and consolidate wealth, and, and that's really what we did. But it was, it was so different in Oklahoma that we had to have a constitutional amendment, state question 434, 
passed in 1966, which created this new legal entity at that time called an Area Vocational Technical School District with its, with its own uh, taxing authority, its own uh, governance, and 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 that's I don't we couldn't pass that in Oklahoma now I guarantee you because it'd get political right away. But we had just the right folks um, in in the governor's office. Uh, uh, we had a, a democratically controlled House and Senate, and we had a Republican governor who was pro-education, and and uh, we had another governor who was getting ready to um, um, run for office who was a senator at that time who wanted to author legislation because he was going to run as the job getting this governor the state had ever seen. And he saw that area of old tech school concept as a, as a means to be able to uh, in, engage in that type of uh, endeavor. But uh, there's no way Oklahoma would be where it wouldn't be if we didn't have our own separate taxing authority. And that comes from consolidation because, you know, we're not a rich state, but uh, just a matter of, um, of the way the infrastructure is de designed for us. Mm -hmm. So that, that would be my suggestion. Just get a state question passed, get your constitution changed, easy stuff. <laughs> yeah, piece of cake. Gary and then Dick? So I said I had learned a lot from many, many people in this room, and, and I didn't really appreciate how challenging rural education was until I had the opportunity to do work in Wyoming with Terry Wigert and others there. Um, it's tough. I mean, we shouldn't kid ourselves. It's very, very difficult to deliver a really rich, resource-rich curriculum um, in many of the small, very isolated. I mean, I, again, I just didn't appreciate how isolated these communities can be until I spent a day driving across uh, the state of Wyoming from Jackson to Casper. That said, um, it is possible in any rural school to design an approach to teaching and learning that emphasizes real world application. Um, it's possible in even the most remote rural school where there may not be employers uh, to develop school-based enterprise um, and other strategies for engaging students in real world application um, and the integration of the academic and, and technical knowledge that can be provided um, in that particular school. You cannot offer uh, the menu of pathways that we've been talking about in larger urban districts, or for that matter, in California, we have the luxury of working with larger rural districts. Um, so you have to make choices. Um, and it's important to design those pathway themes broadly enough uh, so that they can uh, appeal uh, to the wide range of aspirations that will exist even among a student body of, of 50 students. Thanks. Dick? I just had another thought. I don't want to hog this question, but, but you know, I, I keep hearing, we keep hearing, uh, we've heard a lot of mention of the Sputnik moment. You know, we had the real Sputnik moment in 1957, and that was a catalyst for vocational education. In my opinion, we blew it. Uh, when Sputnik happened, uh, Shortly after that, the National Defense Education Act was passed in 58, which created what we all call the new math now because there was a concern we wouldn't have the math, the, the scientists and the engineers to beat the Soviets to the, to the moon. Well, you know, we, we did that and we got, our, we got geared up to that and of course we, uh, Kennedy then in, in his administration said, you know, we're going to land a man on the moon and uh, we did, but, uh, and the Soviets never did make it to the moon, but a funny thing happened on the way to the moon, we found out we had all these these uh, engineers that could design the machinery to get to space, but we didn't have any technicians to be able to keep the doggone stuff running and, uh, you know, to maintain the equipment. And it got to be so severe that uh, President Kennedy at the time had a blue ribbon task force that, uh, you know, uh, addressed this. And that's when the 1963 National Vocational Education Act, some of you, I'm sure, you know, uh, were around when that happened. And, and that created a pool of federal dollars to create an infrastructure for Aerieville Tech Schools. But what happened, most of the states um, chose to um, make those state institutions instead of local institutions. Now, and then when, you know, the feds pulled their money out, I think that's when, when the states failed to, to, to pick up the slack. So, you know, we got another opportunity. We keep hearing that. So let, let's don't blow this one because I really feel like uh, there won't be too many Sputnik moments left. So. Dick, do you want to... Yeah, well, Pearl? Betsy, I was 10 years old on our farm in Illinois when we watched Sputnik go over. You could, uh, in the night sky, you could watch it. Uh, I just wanted to say, uh, again, and because I was from a rural area, I think that if we engage our economic development people on a very large regional basis in rural areas, that's how we can attack the problem. You can always find in some big geography 
in a regional area, uh, a finance industry, a construction industry, some of the industries that are the backbone of what you need to do to start building some pathways. And then there's, there's also some really creative uses of the internet. And I, uh, we've tackled or looked at tackling how to do contextual over the internet. It can be done. You can get teachers to give virtual assignments to students. You can have them working in groups. Uh, you can apply many, if you really think about it, you can apply many of the principles that we know that are good um, CTE principles uh, in rural areas, but you have to be creative. Great. I'm going to ask one more question, then open it up to the audience. And Michael, I think I'll start with you, and we'll go down the panel that way. Can I stick in a little comment and then the last one? Oh, okay. okay. I no didn't problem. realize, yeah. No, no, that's no problem. Uh, the, um, it's interesting, all the references to Kennedy and Khrushchev. I think Kennedy and Khrushchev had the relationship that the non-vocational and the vocational superintendents have. Uh, the, uh, um, uh, the, the, uh, uh, it's, uh, Khrushchev was f famous for his comment, trust but verify. Um, but th that's, uh, blame is of no use. I think we need to identify the obstacles and shape a plan with colleagues from both sides of the bench. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think educators can do far more. It's almost like a federal gridlock. Mm -hmm. it, it just doesn't advance the mission. Uh, and, and blame just has no value in this process. I think that whether you use the Oklahoma model or others, that there are new opportunities to reconfigure curriculum, finance, and uh, the understanding and the relationships between the vocational and non-vocational systems that will be in the best interest of students across this country. Okay, because that's a great lead into my next question, so you partially may have answered some of it. Um, at the conference tomorrow, we are supposed to help craft a call to action on this work and provide advice and guidance to others that are interested in adopting the pathways to prosperity concept. And so one of the, um, one of the things that the conference organizers would like us all to think about uh, is what are some of the things that we can do to move this agenda forward, whether it's at the state level or a community level, district, school level, dare I say federal level, I'm not so sure we need to go there. But what, what are, you know, if you, had, if, if you had your magic wand or you were president for the day, you know, what are some of the things that you might think about doing that would help advance um, and create pathways in more communities? You know, is it flexibility? Is it funding? Uh, is it changes in accountability? Is it culture? Is it leadership? Is it curriculum? Um, let's let's hear your thoughts on that. And so, Michael, you made a few comments, but I'll let you uh, continue on. Well, I think it's it, it's the spirit of my the comments I just made. Uh, I didn't really see any advanced questions. I just went with that response. But the uh, um, the uh, mutual respect will set the table for dialogue uh, and, and advancing the mission. Uh, I believe that school boards oftentimes uh, have created uh, a difficult, if not, uh, you know, inability for superintendents to succeed. Uh, and that's a two-way street as well. I'd like to see greater coordination by the different organizations and hopefully a positive purpose for either serving as a superintendent, not just power, but, but the passion that Tom and others have mentioned, wanting to make a difference for students. Uh, and working as a catalyst in, in, in a sense of uh, peacemaking and, and encouraging common ground. Also, I think that the school committee, school board people need to run with a positive agenda as well. Uh, and, and it'd be great if we can continue to, to nurture people with that student as the real nucleus of, of their interest. Uh, and um, th there can be conversations with the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, the legislators, the governmental structures. Um, that could advance and remove some of the obstacles that currently exist and create new flexibility to, to get the job done. Mm -hmm. Tom, do you have some thoughts? I think a good start might be having the, the next uh, chair of the NGA have on her workforce agenda, workforce uh, education. And by the way, the applause was just perfect because that validated what Governor Fallon is wanting to do. And if she could uh, talk her 49 other uh, uh, governors into having similar types of uh, efforts, I think that would go a long way. Um, another one that, um, another party that we need to cooperate with, you know, and I appreciate what you said about Kennedy and Khrushchev, because to me, times we look at higher ed as being the bad guys, but, but higher ed needs to be a partner, and I'd like to see them engaged. Uh, to me, times uh, we have too many guidance counselors that are coming out of uh, our colleges and universities that still have that, that image that, you know, it's career tech and it's higher ed and, and how do I get evaluated it's by the number of folks I can get with, with college scholarships or into college and somehow we need to uh, 
change, um, you know, that whole mentality in, in, in our colleges and universities that actually prepare our guidance counselors because they do have a big impact on this, this image that we have for career and technical education. I would, I would love to see a, a higher ed brought to the table and enlist them as, as partners in this effort because we can't do it by ourselves and we certainly need higher ed. That's where we get our, when we uh, hire teachers, lots of times they don't have, they don't have baccalaureate degrees. And um, uh, they have to prepare them. You know, I, I can I can hire Francis Tuttle, a skilled craftsman or our technician, and I just pray I can make a teacher out of him. And uh, that's where we need higher ed to help us to make sure we have somebody in that classroom that uh, has the right skills to be able to uh, teach those students. Gary. So I think the first thing is that policy, whether it's at the federal level, the state level, or the local level. Um, has to be committed to making career and technical education an integral part of the larger education system, whether we're talking about K-12 or post-secondary. Continuing to talk about CTE in isolation uh, from the rest of the system is not productive. Um, now, I think pathways provide a very interesting framework for encouraging that kind of integration of, of career and technical education but only if we talk about or think about pathways comprehensively. There's a lot of amb ambiguity around what career pathways really are. Are they simply a sequence or a cluster of four or five CTE courses? Is that a pathway? Or is a pathway a cluster of four or five CTE courses connected to the full complement of core academics along with work-based learning and the supplemental instruction and other kinds of supports students need in a really comprehensive program. That's a very important choice, and we're not being clear about that. Um, thirdly, uh, I would say with respect to pathways, and, and this, there's been, I think, some ambivalence about this even in this conference, I believe uh, the way we design link learning pathways is to prepare students for the full range of post-secondary options. Pathways are not an alternative for students not going to four-year college. Pathways prepare students for four-year college, two-year college, apprenticeship, the military, formal employment training, and it is not necessary, particularly at the high school level, to design a separate pathway. We would need to be really clear about that. There, uh, it's, I, and we can talk about that if you'd like. Next, there has to be real clarity about what high quality pathway design and implementation is, a set of certification criteria uh, that can validate fidelity to uh, uh, the kinds of strategies and models and pathways uh, that we know to be effective, uh, as demonstrated by data uh, on some commonly agreed metrics as to what it constitutes to be college and career ready. And then finally, I would say, and this is sort of tough at the, from a policy perspective, there has to be a commitment to adopting a really a systemic approach, particularly at the regional or district level. Um, if we continue to go at this pathway by pathway, school by school, uh, we're going to continue to produce the one-off islands of excellence that we have uh, seen for the past 30 years. Um, and until we find a way to approach this systemically and policy that reinforces that, uh, I think we're going to have problems. Well, and I'll just key off of that a little bit. You heard Rick Stevens this morning from Boeing. Uh, Rick is also um, with a equally fairly tall blonde woman who named Elaine Scott, who they happen to be married. Uh, they have an organization called Birth to Work, and if you look up Birth in the in the numeral two work dot org, Birth to Work dot org, you'll see that their approach is to help communities. And uh, I had mentioned when I was uh, opening earlier that uh, CORD helped start an organization in Waco called the Greater Waco Community Education Alliance. And we formed it around the, the, the ideal that, well, state and federal resources would be greatly helpful to solve our education problems. We couldn't wait, always, for state and federal resources. And most communities have foundations, have resources, have organizations, communities and schools, PTAs, uh, faith-based organizations, you just name them, they're in silos. And we formed around the idea that we would engage stakeholders at all levels in that community and break down those barriers and start to talk about systemic change, 
uh, essentially prenatal care all the way through uh, changing careers as adults. And that's what we're doing in the community. And, and I submit that uh, that's where we have to take part of the fight. It has to be local. It has to be local determination, engaging business very proactively. Uh, I'm, and again, I mentioned birth to work because they, they do that. And uh, when Rick uh, retires from Boeing in a few weeks, he's going to go full time with his or he and Elaine's organization uh, with birth to work. You may want to see him before uh, before you leave, or at least um, look up birthtowork.org. But uh, again, it's taking it to the community. It's finding out in the Waco area we can identify on an annual basis the 200. Um, girls who will probably become pregnant as, as uh, uh, early high school youth and the services that would be needed for those students. Now that, on the one hand, that's a tragic kind of a thing to even think about, but if you're not engaging the students at an early level by the time we get to, and the issues of poverty and the issues of, of choice, uh, by the time they get to high school, we're behind the curve. So I, I think that you start with the community, you start organizing inside your community, you look at the stakeholders, you get them engaged, and then ultimately you build great career pathways. Great, okay. Um, lots of great ideas here. I think our speakers are around after the uh, workshop session, so grab one of them if you're interested. We have time for just a couple of questions. So um, yes, the lady in the back. So I'll, I'll, I'm happy to take a first crack at that. So um, are any of my California colleagues here? Is Russ, Russ? No, Russ isn't here. Okay. In California, we have what you may know as A to G. Um, so the University of California and the CS, California State University require students uh, to pass with a C or better 15, a minimum of 15 core academic courses in math, science, English, social studies, foreign language, visual and performing arts, and an elective. Um, one of the big struggles has been how do you, how do you, time is very precious in these schools. Um, and largely due to the work of the University of California and Roman Stearns, who actually now works at Connect Ed, there are now 10,000 CTE courses in California that meet one or more of the A to G requirements for admission to UC. So many of them are in the elective courses. Um, but in the case of Project Lead the Way courses, those of you who are familiar with Project Lead the Way, some of those now uh, will um, uh, fulfill a science requirement. Um, we have uh, UCOP, or the, uh, the UC Office of the President, University of California Office of the President, has been working hard to develop um, uh, math courses in various um, uh, pathways in business and finance that will meet the math requirements for A to G. Um, and begins to address that those those issues. There are others as well, but that gives you a flavor. Thank you. Um, yeah. Gene, there's a Gene, there's a microphone coming. Uh, Gary, those 10,000 courses are not a course that's approved statewide, except for a few. Most of those are individual courses that have been approved for a given school, right? Well, sort of. So we're working on that, Gene. So. Um, the, 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 for many years, the process, and it was very cumbersome as you can imagine, was that course by course, school by school, we had uh, each course had to get approval from the, U the University of California Office of the President, and it went through this very laborious and, and um, time-consuming uh, review process. For certain pathways, and Project Lead the Way is one, um, are any of my NAF colleagues here? Um, Hey, David. Um, we work very closely with NAF, and, and NAF is getting program status for many of it, what we call program status for um, uh, technical curriculum. Uh, AG in California has long had program status with a cluster of about uh, 
oh, a, a dozen different courses, which if any district adopts is automatically eligible for A to G. So we're trying to streamline this process, um, but it, 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 you're right, Gene, for a long time it was course by course, school by school. Michael, Just to add to the question, if I may, uh, the, the academic obligations of the career tech students in the high schools in Massachusetts are the same as those in a non-vocational system. So one of the benefits, one of the challenges, the benefit is the fact students earn two credentials, both the academic uh, high stakes testing requirements are all the same, uh, and the, whether it be four years of math, science, and the whole deal, it's all part. Oftentimes taught in alternating week structures, a week of academic with embedded or integrated vocational technical skills, and the reverse in the following week, academic with embedded vocational technical skills. Um, I actually have a copy of the view book which details the program of studies which I'll give you if you have interest. Thank you for your question. Okay, there's another question over here. Um, yes, I'd like to know what Would you guys you are doing. Would you identify yourself, please? Uh, yes, I'm Donna Bohorich. I'm from the State uh, Board of Education in Texas. Um, I uh, am interested in finding out what you're doing. We lose so many uh, students at ninth grade. So what are you doing at the eighth grade level, if any of you are uh, you have programs in place that are introducing students to these options and programs of studies that they could uh, possibly take advantage of, career opportunities, you know, that sort of thing. In Massachusetts, one verb, recruiting them. That would work in Oklahoma, too. I wish we were, were doing more. Um, we, the only sophomores that, that are enrolled at Francis Tuttle are, are at risk. Uh, uh, overage uh, sophomores, and then also uh, through our project, lead the way. You know, we went in our career academies, but uh, we need to be doing more. I couldn't agree. That's that's a weakness right now in in the Oklahoma system. So, so what I love about Pathways is that it provides a way to begin to address this issue. So, in California, link learning began as a high school initiative in these districts, but within two years, most of the districts realized this was at a minimum grades six through 12, and in fact, in many of our districts now has been become a K through 12 initiative. Now, what does that mean? And I can't get too much into the details. It doesn't mean you take the high school approach to pathways and push it down into K-8, but it does mean, for example, that you begin to introduce much earlier in the K-8 experience attention to project-based learning that is emphasizing real-world application and being used, again, sort of systematically, not necessarily system systemically, to introduce students to a wider range of, of career options. And I'd be happy to tell you more about that. But again, I think it's the power of this pathway notion is that it forces asking exactly the kind of question that you're asking and doing something about it. Now, I'm, I'm not originally from Texas, so if you kick me out for what I'll say, but Achieve Texas, which is one of your programs, is one of the best career pathways programs in the country. The problem with it is it's not mandatory. You make it elective for school districts. If you want to do something in Texas, make it mandatory. Just one quick footnote. You, you should talk to our friend Gene Bottoms before you leave because he's really thought about this middle school issue harder than many of us. Yeah, great. Okay, I think we have time for just one yeah, I'm, final I'm Rich Feller and I am from higher education and I train uh, counselors. And I'm also president of the National Career Development Association. Would you each speak to what you'd like to tell counselors to do differently. Oh. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna get myself in real trouble here. Um, I, I think we have a lot of hard work to do on this front. Um, first of all, in, in California, we have very few counselors left. I, you know, we're going through fiscal hell in California. As somebody once said, when you're going through hell, keep going. We're trying to do that. Um, but one of the consequences is that there are very few counselors left. Now, here's where I may get myself in trouble, and I don't mean this disrespectfully. Um, that may be a good thing, because I think it's going to force us uh, to think much more uh, creatively, and I hope effectively, about how to do counseling. Um, unfortunately, there's, there's never been much career counseling in high school. The kind of counseling that has been there is counseling kids to prepare for four-year college and university, a very valuable thing. I'm not putting it down. But if you really want to introduce career awareness and career exploration into high schools, we're going to have to find a different approach. And I, and I think it's one that relies much more heavily on uh, faculty and, frankly, on employers. And it's, it's one way to really engage employers uh, in this work. 
Rich, Rich just comments? a comment. I, mean, I, I think people, the counseling would benefit from organizations like your, like your own, as far as promoting a new awareness of the need for relevance and a grounding within the various occupations. Uh, I think that uh, school systems have to give guidance counselors a chance to modify the role and transition them through for the professional development and the investment in their education. Uh, Work-related experiences uh, need to be very much part of that. And they need credibility, and they'll, they'll earn it in, in systems where the guidance counselor is interested, respectful of, of both the academic and vocational technical skill sets that usually come uh, from colleagues. Uh, and that type of partnering uh, will bolster them uh, relative to their, their ability to contribute to the system. Where it works, I think they've done incredible things, and where they remove obstacles that high school, adolescents oftentimes address in, in today's society relative to depression and so many other factors, that there's a factor of school safety and there's a factor of individual safety and better prepares a person, a student in that case, to gain from the investment being made by the Career Tech Center. Well, I know we could easily spend another hour or two with this group. Um, a tremendous experience, um, but we're trying to keep you on time. The next concurrent session start at 4.10, so you have a little bit of a break. But um, I hope you'll take advantage of coming up to speak with some of our panelists here or grabbing them throughout the uh, evening or day tomorrow. But please join me in thanking them for a great job. Thank you all very, very much.